The most controversial for last in the final year of the four-team playoff era, disgust, anger, resignation, acceptance. That could be the playoff. It could also be the quarterback portal, which is spinning wide open. This is the College Game Day podcast for Monday, December 4th, the day after the playoff teams were announced. Reese Davis and Pete Thamel here. Number one, Michigan, no surprise. Number two, Washington, no surprise. Frankly, I think number three, Texas, no surprise. And that brought us down to the final slot in the college football playoff between undefeated Florida State, ACC champion, most worthy, but the extenuating circumstance of having their leader, Jordan Travis, out for the season, quarterback, and the fact that the offense had been underwhelming in his absence in the two games against Power 5 competition. So, in the end, it went to Alabama, SEC champion. Of course, there was outrage all around. Uh, Pete, I had four hours on TV yesterday to try to find the nuance, to try to navigate the emotion of strongly, strongly held opinions uh, on both sides and some opinions that were somewhere in the middle. Where did you land on this? So I, I sort of hinted at my, uh, at, at my stance sort of going in uh, last week, Reese, uh, I said it would be a shame if Florida State got left out. And again, we didn't know uh, the exact confluence of how everything was going to funnel through until that last great Saturday of college football was played. And it was a dramatic Saturday, mm-hmm. which shouldn't get which shouldn't get overshadowed. Like it was a it was a really, really fun day that had a that had sort of a spine of drama that we really haven't seen uh, that we haven't seen from there. And um by the time I got home Saturday night from uh, from Atlanta, going to the SEC game, uh, I mean, the only thing I was certain of is that someone was going to be really mad, and something unprecedented was going to happen to make that person mad, uh, or make that team, that fan base mad. And it was either going to be a head-to-head competitor, Texas, getting left out, an undefeated conference champion in Florida State getting left out, or an SEC champion in Alabama getting left out. Those were essentially, the, you know, when you distilled it all to the... Those final three for two slots, it was that that's what the argument was distilled to. And I probably thought Florida State was more deserving, but I understand why Alabama was put in. I guess by the end, you know, you, you look look all night on social media Saturday, all morning, Sunday at all the all the conviction people have had and uh, all the numbers that have been dug up. And I just landed in that Florida State what they had done had been a playoff resume for nine years, uh, a no-brainer playoff resume for nine years. And um, I did appreciate what their defense did on Saturday night. I mean, they have an elite oh, defense. Great. Uh, I don't know how Fisk wasn't the most valuable player in that game. What do you have, four and a half TFLs? Yeah. Like, my God. Um, and uh, and obviously, Jared Verse has really come on at the end of this season. Um, Fabian Lovett played great. They, they're, they're a very good team. And... Um, it turned probably a little bit too much into a beauty contest and reputation contest for my taste. But that said, I, I'm not going to sit here and say Alabama didn't deserve to get in. They're very good. They've gotten better. Their argument is strong. I just thought going off precedent and going off how the committee laid out what it wants and desires, language I'm sure you're very familiar with because you repeated it for four hours mm-hmm. on uh, on Sunday. That That is where I landed. But I, uh, you know, I wasn't screaming from the rooftops. I, I got it. It was hard. I, that, I think that I have fundamental baseline respect for a difficult decision. Th- knowing this was going to be like the first time committee members are going to get hate mail mm-hmm. uh, type of a situation. You know, Pete, I think when you, when you go through this, you can start picking apart different perspectives and different arguments based on verbiage. For instance, um, you go through the por- protocol, and I think deserving only appears one time. And it's uh, sort of in reference to how the teams are picked and sort of in the context of otherwise deserving when they're talking about giving the committee latitude to pick teams. Um, Best appears a lot. But the problem with best is that it's in the eye of the beholder. And so what defines best? There's no best could be defined by some committee members as the best resume or the most deserving one, or the team with a zero in the lost column. That is why we've always said that we need human judgment in the room as opposed to computers. However, you know, this is really the first time because uh, for years and years, I 
uh, sort of fell on the side of thinking that the human judgment, the human evaluation was probably the most appropriate way to go. Certainly not foolproof, but you have a, a number of people in there and they come to a collective decision. Um, there's part of me now that when you see the, the vitriol and the reaction that almost wonders if a formula isn't better. Now, what would be the best formula? I don't know. And it's not because I'm taking exception with what the committee did. The, the one thing that has frustrated me for a while, and uh, we got some reaction uh, you know, on this, is this notion that performance, once you get to the event, somehow validates or invalidates your selection. So, sure. so I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. All you have to go on is what did you accomplish in the moment. You also have to go on what are you likely to accomplish given your current state. And with Florida State, I really believe, at least to my eyes, that it was unfair to evaluate their offense based on the ACC championship game because Brock Glenn, who, who may turn out to be a wonderful player, very talented sure. guy, you know, he, he's like a lot of guys. He's not ready for that moment yet in this current moment in his development. Going to be good. Need some time. Nothing wrong with that. Jordan Travis was a great player. Needed some time. It's okay. You know, Bo Nix needed time. So it's not, I'm not casting aspersions at him by saying that. He just needed some time. They were going to get Tate Rodemaker back. And as it turns out, the best thing that could have happened for Florida State Saturday night would have been had Rodemaker been able to play and play well. If he had played well, and I don't mean Cardell Jones well, he didn't have to put up 59, but maybe a little better than he played in the swamp, you know, and they were a little more potent because, you know, they were right around 200 yards of offense in the two full games uh, against Power 5 opponents, a little over that, 220, I think, in the two Power 5 games after Jordan Travis was hurt. But had Rodemaker been able to play against Louisville, maybe they put up 400. Maybe he throws a couple of touchdown passes. And if he does, then I think it's a pretty – Pretty easy decision, certainly not one that Greg Sankey would have agreed with, but I think a pretty easy decision had Florida State's offense been more functional. So all of the other arguments, you know, Alabama, people who believed Alabama should be in, said, hey, 50 spots is 50 spots. You know, they, they beat number one, they beat number 10, and they lost to number three. And while from start to finish, it looked to me in that game like Texas was the better team. You know, this notion that they got destroyed that night is not accurate. They were ahead in the fourth quarter, meaning Alabama had the lead in the fourth quarter. Pretty short-lived. And as I said, I thought Texas was the better team pretty much the entire 60 minutes that night. But, you know, so my point in saying all this is not to advocate for Alabama, but to say those who put stock in strength of schedule say there's 50 spots difference. In Alabama's and Florida State's, they beat number one. They beat number ten. You know, they beat the same. They beat the same team that Florida State beat. Uh, you know, for Florida State's best win. So there were some resume points in Alabama's favor. But I do. I firmly believe, and I believe the committee would have acted this way if Rodemaker had been able to go and had played effectively on offense, a little more effectively than than they played in the swamp, which was a difficult environment and tough situation. I believe Florida State would have gotten the nod. So all of these other things, the strength of schedule argument, the conspiracy theories about the SEC, um, you know, the uh, brand bias toward Alabama, you know, you're never going to be able to convince anybody that those didn't play a factor. But in my judgment, the only, the, I won't say the only, the overwhelming factor was the availability of Jordan Travis. It's in their protocol. They looked into it, and this was the decision they came to. And whether people want to believe it or not, uh, nobody on that set Sunday who favored Florida State or favored Alabama had anything but absolute heartbreak for what we witnessed when we saw Florida State's reaction not getting in. It was, I mean, it was, it was terrible. And... The one big change it left with me, Pete, and you know I've been on here, and I'm mm -hmm. still going to miss the giant regular season games. I'm going to miss them. Oh, yeah. I'm going to miss them. I've said it time yeah. and time again. But after seeing that, I was like, you know what? 
time for expansion. Uh, you know, yeah. time for expansion. Yeah. Did you uh, ponder much? And you had a lot of time to obviously think about this, uh, talking to millions of people about it on a Sunday, about how the alliance sort of ruined this. Like this could have been, this could have been, this should have happened this year. And there was that weird time post COVID, the filibuster of mm-hmm. Jim Phillips of. George Klyovkov, who, by the way, came out of hiding for for a brief moment on Friday in the uh, at the Pac-12 title game, and obviously uh, Kevin Warren, who's off with the uh, who's off with the Bears now. They when they when everybody got rattled by Oklahoma and Texas going to the SEC, they formed this ill-fated and ham-handed alliance uh, that ended up really looking bad for Klyovkov and Phillips because they went and got uh, they went and ended up getting poached um, or. I should say that. I should say Klyovkov ended up getting poached, and uh, they joined each other so they wouldn't expand, and then they expanded. Anyway, part of that was a filibuster for this playoff expanding and moving because they didn't like the process on how it was handled, and that sort of that temper tantrum ended up costing Florida State a spot in a way because this thing should have been at twelve, mm-hmm. and so there is there's there's disappointment in, in that that like there was a this this season was built for the upcoming playoff. Mm-hmm. And we could not say that about some other seasons that we've had. Um, when you start going down the, uh, you know, down, down the list, like a lot of years, Georgia's resume would have got him in. A lot of years, Ohio State's resume would have got him mm-hmm. in, right? For sure. Like you got, yeah. you have you have two teams with one loss to a playoff team. Well, I mean, it got Ohio State in last year. Yes. It was basically yes. the same resume, you know? Yes. And, um, there's nobody would think in a 12 team playoff that Florida State with a with a healthy Rodemaker has a chance and that defense showed it the other night. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Ohio State with with a with a one score loss that they're dri- and they're driving at the end in in Michigan territory, they certainly have the weapons to uh to to win a playoff game. And then uh and then obviously Georgia, I mean, look, they lost the SEC title game a couple of years ago. Uh, to Alabama uh, and with a flatter field got in came back and uh and, and and ran back to the title game so I just think that when I look holistically about it uh Dan Wetzel and Ross Dellinger pointed that out on on Twitter the the, the two games in I wrote about it back in 21 and said at some point you are doing especially because the Pac-12 and the ACC have been fairly irrelevant the ACC other than Clemson, mm-hmm. the Pac-12 in general since 16. Like, how could you be against access? Like, that just, that, that never made sense to me from from a, you know, how could you do it? You don't think Oregon would, who, who'd want to play Oregon in this in this playoff right now? Mm-hmm. I know they didn't play great the other night, but like, they can, they could match up and roll against a lot of these teams. So, um, I wish, I wish this thing had been fast forward. The complications that are college sports slowed it down. Um, the debate at number 13 is going to be similar than, you know, the, the debate over the, what is it now? Uh, 69th team in the tournament. Yeah, like, yeah. You, you know, there'll be, there'll be a day of conversation about it and then everyone will move on. I really thought SMU got robbed Reese. And that's not, that's not a knock on Liberty. You want to talk about strength of schedule difference. I mean, my gosh. Well, I didn't know that Liberty was coming up and look i'm happy for jamie chadwell who's a great guest yeah. on our show and and you know great coach yeah terrific Woo. coaching good for them they won uh, yeah you know, they won all their games but when i was setting it up i was i was setting up the you know the situation with to say you know sort of look at it and say okay here is another undefeated team you know and will they will they get the access that they crave yet there are flaws in the resume far different ones you know, Florida State's was uh, completely beyond their control. And I guess Liberty's was to a degree, too, because I don't know if people are lining up to play them or if they're really, you know, scrambling around to get in line to play, you know, some of the uh, big boys. I fully expected to see SMU in that slot and didn't. You know, so I was I was I was taken aback. A couple of reporters that actually like put them in and like you know the people who jump the bull thing. Yeah. So you you weren't you weren't the only one. But you know, and um, but to to get back to your original point about uh, the access, it I was reminded of it. Uh, it never really popped up organically in the conversation, and there's also that feeling when you're in the moment of the reveal and discussing what's happened that sometimes that type of situation is better left for Monday 
because yeah, you can't fair. you can't change it. You know, I mean, getting uh, you know getting Mike Norvell's reaction to the fact that they didn't expand sure. the playoff by now is not yeah. as in the moment newsworthy as the reaction to what he believed to be an, was an injustice. Um, you know, the one thing, too, about the people who are upset, and look, all fans, I love the fact that they are upset. It means they care. It, mean, it means mm-hmm. they want to watch college game day. It means they listen to this podcast. It means they watch the games. I was a little surprised that uh, I got some of the reaction, you know, privately getting, you know, hammered from Georgia people. I guess it's because of the precedent of number one, had never fallen completely out. Number one, meaning in the penultimate rankings of the playoff committee, had never fallen completely out. But Georgia's Georgia's case was very much like Alabama's case last year in that they really mm-hmm. didn't have one. You know, I mean, because yeah. you can evaluate best and stars and Vegas favorites and all those things are worthy in terms of evaluation. But in order to be best to me, you have to have some level of accomplishment that is significant. And while a 29-game winning streak, two national championships in the broad context of college football is an amazing accomplishment, within these 13 games, the best that Georgia could offer, while very good, were two home wins against Missouri and Ole Miss. And... Those are good wins, really good wins. Not, you know, I'm not saying, wow, that's easy. That's a hard thing to do. Those are two good teams, especially the way they stomped Ole Miss. That's a hard thing to do. But in this year with so many worthy candidates, I just, I didn't, I didn't really feel like Georgia had a case other than the two time champion, historical precedent number one had never fallen all the way below four. And so now we, in the final year of it, you have, two unprecedented things, or three if you want to get technical. One, Georgia falls out, and two teams who were below six in the second-to-last rankings both made it into the field. And, of course, the the obvious one with Florida State being undefeated, Power Five, a conference champion, and being left out. So, you know, it's, it's it's an interesting thing, too, Pete, as you go through this year and we'll bring it back to this year but one thing that i did notice that as we go to 12 next year and start thinking about that format and conference realignment goes along with that with texas oklahoma going to the sec and the four teams from the pac-12 going uh, to the big 10 primarily i know a couple are going elsewhere too or others are going elsewhere but those two conferences primarily have a look at the rankings and have a look at uh, where, who would have it would have been impossible for teams to get buys. For instance, the all four teams in the playoff will be in one of those two conferences next year, meaning that under the format next year, only one from each conference could have gotten the buy, right? Mm-hmm. So you you start looking and you go down. And I know that because of um, the different schedules that it won't wind up just this way next year, but just for the exercise sake, if you say Michigan, uh, Michigan and Texas get the buys uh, next, under next year's format as champions of the Big Ten and the SEC respectively, then that mean, and then Florida State would have gotten, you know, would have gotten the third buy um, because they would be champions of the ACC. Now start looking. And you have to, you have to go for a while before you, before you get to the before you get to a team outside of that. That would have meant that I believe the fourth buy would have belonged, if you went by these rankings, to Big 12 champion Arizona. And you go on down a little further, and I'll, I'll wrap this up with that. That would be Big 12 yeah. champion Arizona. And then if you stay with the six and six, meaning six automatic bids and six uh, at large, which I don't think they will. I think they'll probably move it to five and seven. You, Unless I'm overlooking somebody, depending on how you're going to deal with um, – Oregon State, Liberty, and SMU would get uh, would have gotten the next two spots. Huh? That's I didn't I didn't game that out. That's uh, that's pretty interesting. Let's let's roll our friend uh, Ryan McGee in here, Reese, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tee Ryan up with a uh, 
with a bigger picture question as we as we dive in here um because i do think like we've had a day like you said of the emotion the minutia the argument of uh of how all this stuff works but my my thought seeing the the vitriol and my thought seeing all the uh all, all the reaction was what could change because of this, right? Like there was just enough happening where I thought back to 2011 and in real time, nobody said in the wake of Alabama LSU that that's the reason that the playoff went from two, from the BCS to four to the CFP. But in reality, like the commissioners six, eight months later after everything got in motion and then it happened, they said, the reason why we have a 14 playoff now is we were dis- we were disgusted that the SEC had both teams in the playoff. We didn't think that was right. We needed more access and that, uh, and that, and that pushed everything there. So thinking, thinking, just watching all this online, you know, statement from the Florida state coach, statement from the Florida state president, statement from the Florida state athletic director, um, they used the Ward Manual uh, statement ad lib clearly because those were not subtle statements. Uh, I, uh, and I and I'd like to ask Ryan this. So, if 2011 brought us a four-team playoff, now we're on the precipice next year of a 12-team playoff. What could some of the legacy of this controversy end up being? Um, could it be Florida State? looks around in that in the ACC and doesn't feel like that's the right forum to move it forward. I think if this was four years ago, that definitely that conversation could have been accelerated. And they, quite frankly, have accelerated that conversation plenty. I'm just curious if we think there's some macro, big picture, ripple reverberation. I would imagine if the SEC had gotten left out, this is a more robust conversation, right? Because, they, you know, obviously they're going to control – not any of the format stuff in the 12, but there's still stuff like um, finances that are going to be figured out. There's still stuff of uh, just TV. How like There's still a lot to be determined in the 12, even though we have the 12. In fact, the fact that it's so close and some stuff hasn't been settled yet is, I would say, even a little bit unusual. So I'm just curious how yesterday impacts the big picture. So I think there's, I kind of have two perspectives. I have the literal boots on the ground as I sit here in Charlotte, which is where I live, and literally driving home from Atlanta on Saturday night, drove past Bank of America Stadium, and they were in the second half and the lights were on, and I, I almost pulled in there. I almost went into the state, tried to get into the stadium for the second half. I kind of wished I had now, but I was a little wore out at that point. Good to see both of you guys on the sideline, by the way, in Atlanta. It was the first time I'd seen Reese like all season. But we, so I, I um, but here in Charlotte, ACC headquarters, 15 minutes from my house. The, the immediate fear is this is the juice that Florida State needs to get out of here. Because why does Mike Norvell take this job for the opportunity to coach it for a national championship? You know, why, why do you want to be at Florida State for the opportunity to play for a national championship? And if the perception is going to be you're not – you don't have a platform that can get you there, then now the conversation that, oh, remember this was still going on in the middle of August about Florida State wanting out of the ACC and then it went away – I, Pete, I don't know. I don't think they can afford to do it because the numbers, the money is just astronomical. But that conversation is the immediate concern. But as far as long term, I think the fact that we're going to twelve teams next year anyway kind of fixes it, right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what if there's any long, far-reaching impact on this, just simply because the 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 fix is sitting in front of us. In theory, you know, there's certainly things that can be done. You mentioned it. Certainly, things that can be done within that but i mean the reality is a year from now i don't know what we're going to talk about on this pod because it's going to be about the number 13 team that thinks it got screwed and to me that's not even that compelling yeah so i don't know i so so yeah so so i just think long term i don't know that there is any impact just in the immediacy of the moment the concern over in south charlotte um at the acc office is how do we handle this because you know if your flagship football school, no offense to Clemson, doesn't believe that it can get to a national title run because of it, but now they can because mm-hmm. next year they would have been in. You know, I referenced this a little bit earlier. I think the big picture thing could be a reevaluation of how um, how much latitude and how much discretion the committee has and whether there are more concrete guidelines 
because you already have some of this taken care of with whatever number of automatic bids that they wind up with. Six now, uh, my, I, my suspicion is that it will end up being five with the basic uh, dissolving of the Pac-12, that it's going to wind up there at five and seven at larges. So then are they going to be a little more beholden to some type of formula, maybe not exclusively, but something that gives them something a little less subjective to use in their evaluation. Um, I think that could be part of it because it's not, I think the committee has done an admirable job and let's be, let's be candid about this. If you, if you don't have a horse in the race, if you either are not a Florida state supporter, not an ACC supporter, not an Alabama supporter, SEC supporter, or hater of either. If you just step back and look at the decision that had to be made yesterday, and that's what I said right off the top in setting the scene. Somebody's dream is going to be made and somebody's are going to be broken. There was no other choice. Somebody was going to be unhappy and feel slighted. And there, you know, for years, we've had, we've had people at our place say, don't just count the number of losses just because there is a one in the loss column of one team and a two in the loss column of the other does not mean that one is better than two and zero is better than one. It can, and that certainly should be accomplishment in your favor because it is extraordinarily difficult. And, uh, you know, that was the thing that, that Dan Mullen kept saying yesterday and totally respect it. It's hard to go undefeated. Of, co- of course it is. I mean, I don't think anyone argues that it's not. Hard for Liberty to go undefeated. They did. And, you know, regardless of your schedule, hard not to, uh, you know, have a slip up, hard not to find that banana peel somewhere along the way that you deserve, you deserve credit for that. Um, So I wonder if the big picture thing is that there is a little less subjectivity uh, given to the committee when getting these, uh, how many ever at large bids it winds up being next year. Because the other thing, you know, you talked about with Florida State, the access point is fixed. You know, it's even it's even fixed for a Liberty. Jamie Chadwell brought that up yesterday. If this were next year, Liberty would be in the in the mix for the national championship. No, and, and, and but that that part of it is is um, and and I wonder too. I'm obsessed and have been forever with with this super conference idea, which is obviously. I mean, you know, if we get to four, we're kind of there anyway. But Pete, I mean, does it accelerate? that i mean it is if there's more disgruntlement among members listen everyone in the sec right now is totally fine i mean they, you know, that, that's everyone's happy you know their team was in whatever i mean no one in the big 10 has a lot of complaints right now but you know does one disgruntled conference when we're down to four power five conferences power four conferences does one disgruntled conference or, or a couple of members within a disgruntled conference does that I mean, I don't know. That 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 concept is always fascinating. I saw a year ago next week, uh, I sat at Roy Kramer's house uh, interviewing, and for folks that don't know, the commissioner of the mm-hmm. SEC, who is the godfather of not just uh, conference championship games and divisions at the highest level, but, but the godfather of the BCS formula. And he looked at me and he said, if you have more than 16 teams, you can't, you can't keep it together. And he told me that in 2010. And he told me that again a year ago, and nothing he's ever said has been wrong. So it's it's hard for me. To, so I don't know. That's the part. Does the disgruntlement have a larger, or, or am I just prisoner of the moment? Because again, I'm sitting here in Charlotte, where the ACC is trying to hold it together. You know, here just you know, not even 24 hours after we find out Florida State's not in. Yeah, I think more than 16 is almost like not like a league. It's like a consortium. Right. Or, uh, exactly what know, Kramer like said. A, right. Right. It's just it's, too it's, much to keep track of. Right. Yes, it, it. There's no. What makes league play great is you know that uh, uh, Alabama is going to play Ole Miss every year, right? You know what I mean. Right. And in the water cooler in the you know downtown Atlanta, all the Bama alums in the Ole Miss alums know that every you know that they, they can sort of look to every Saturday, right. and they uh, and they don't have that. I really think. You know, people go to relegation as the next steps right away, right, Ryan? And I, I really don't see that right now, but I do see and would be, you know, I think it's predictive that I don't think the cutting the pie evenly is going to last. Like, 
Ohio State football and Indiana football should not be making the same amount of money. Michigan football and Northwestern football should not be making the same amount of money. That's just turning into really bad business, especially when you have, let's call it what it is, a payroll, right? You have that. Alabama and Vanderbilt don't bring the same value. Georgia and South Carolina, fill in the blank, whoever, um, Mississippi State, don't bring the same value. So I do think that those inequities now, because everyone's under the same roof, are going to become more glaring. I think from a conference perspective, that's the that's the biggest thing. I would think the SEC would be happy to sit at 16 for a while because I really think they like their footprint. There's enough intimacy. They they kind of they have a region right now. The only thing that disrupts that is if, if they have to play defense because they don't want the Big Ten to come into their region. So is that Florida State? Is that North Carolina, which is which is coveted? Virginia is coveted. I, I think the the rankings and the people in Florida State and Clemson don't like to hear this, but it's North Carolina, Virginia, Clemson, Florida State, and maybe Florida State then Clemson, just because they bring more eyeballs and TV sets. So those are the schools in the crosshairs. As of right now, there's nowhere to go. But um, and I've used this analogy before. It's like the old spy versus spy. Everybody in suburban Chicago has got their periscope up and they're looking at Birmingham. Everyone in Birmingham has got their periscope up and they're looking at suburban Chicago. And that's ultimately going to define our landscape. What we don't know about the 12-team playoff is will it, will it bring peace and prosperity? Because if you're in the Big 12 right now, you got a pretty good path to the playoff. Like Kansas wakes up every day thinking they can go to the playoff, mm-hmm. right? right? That's, that's something powerful. Um, you know, there's five, six schools in the SEC that don't wake up thinking that. There's six or seven schools in the Big Ten that don't wake up thinking that. So there's a little bit of power and possibility. And I think the Big 12 strength right now is there's a power and peer, right? We could, uh, all of us could say, who's going to win the Big 12 next year? And we're all going to have different answers. So that's fun, right? Mm-hmm. And you put the games on Thursday and you're a little wacky and, you know, the you, you win 52-51. There's, there's something good about that. The, the question becomes... Does this next iteration of the college football playoff, which is going to be two years, then 10 years, I believe, does that create a separation where we sit around the Monday after the selection and say, oh, it should be, you know, conference champions. And then, you know, you're going to throw in the little guy and then it's just the rest are. So what's that? Seven spots? If it's yeah, if it winds up five and six. seven, yeah. Now they say six and yeah, six. Seven. It winds up five and seven, and then seven. it should be four Big Ten and three SEC, or four SEC and three Big Ten. Like, does that separation start? Um, the, the financial separation is there and it's real, right? Like, there's no, there's no denying that. So anyway, that's uh, after Reese was dialed into the minutia of uh, you know strength of schedule rankings and Massey indexes yesterday. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he didn't think we'd be talking about like. The future of, uh, yeah. you know, the 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 historical uh, battlegrounds of the of the infrastructure of the sport. Uh, Ryan, I, I brought up to Pete just before you joined us, and we don't have to replow the ground, but to sort of emphasize Pete's point uh, with the understanding that the rankings would likely change because the schedules would change, and people would you know have played each other and added losses and all of that. But if you took next year's format with this year's final ranking. Unless I'm overlooking somebody, the only team uh, in the top 12 and really in down to the top 13 that won't be SEC or Big Ten next year is Florida State. And if you gamed it out, which we did earlier, Arizona would have gotten one of the buys as champion of the new Big 12 if it were, you know, if it were like that next year, which is which is kind of weird. And I know it won't go, but I, I do think it speaks to some of the things that, that you guys were talking about, about the, about the future of it. No, it's crazy. And, and, but, but I'll say this, and, I, and, I, and I, I don't just do this because every time I bring up NASCAR, a lot of people get really angry with me for talking about it. But, but, I, but there is a cautionary tale there. And Reese knows this because Reese covered it and Reese lived it with me. But you can mess with it too much. And, 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 mm-hmm. and so you still have to maintain enough simplicity – and you have to keep your feet somewhere rooted in what got you to where you are because all this stuff that we're talking about, we start talking about, you start trying to explain to, you know, SEC football fans or Big Ten football fans relegation. You know, when it starts getting too complicated, 
you know, when you, and this was part of the biggest complaint at the beginning of the BCS was, hey, this is math. I don't want to do math. I want to talk about football. So you have to be careful because I can tell you firsthand what happened in NASCAR was you, you thought that core audience was always going to stick around no matter what, but you kept messing with it and messing with it and messing with it and messing with it. And before you know it, you've gotten so far away from who you were that they don't recognize who you are anymore. So as long as, as long as a Saturday afternoon in October, there's still passion in the stadium and there's still the water cooler talk that you're talking about, uh, Pete, with, you know, the Ole Miss fans know they're going to, you, you know, stick it to the Alabama fans and vice versa or, or you know, Ohio State and, and, and whoever. Um, you have to, everything you do going forward, you can't make it so complicated that people don't understand what they're looking at. And, and mm-hmm. so that, that I, I worry about that going forward when, when you start, when the postseason starts to become, again, NFL, right? And we're talking about tiebreakers and we're talking about this and we're talking about that. In the end, this debate that we're having today and what and, and Reese's world all day on Sunday, that's important to maintain something of that so that we can, that you, there's still the passion still needs to be there. So just, that's what I worry about is just be, just make sure don't do what NASCAR did and get so far away from who you were that one day you wake up and the people who fell in love with you as kids don't know who you are anymore. And they went and found something else to do. That, that's probably the best argument I can think of for keeping the conference championship games because yep. I, I do have some concern about their, their value, not their financial value. Clearly there's great financial value there, particularly for the SEC, but the value that we've talked about many, many times, if Ohio State and Michigan had turned around and played the next week, um, you know, if Alabama and Auburn played consecutive weeks, which, you know, the kick six year uh, under next year's format, they would have played again, uh, I believe, the next week. And then if, you, if both teams make it and then you play a third time, how, you know, how does that diminish it? But Greg Sankey said, don't you want to see the championship settled on the field? And I do, but then you're just moving to the next championship. So, but probably the familiarity component of it, Ryan, that you bring up is the most compelling case not to just say, okay, we're going to 12, go ahead and go to 16, and let's make this championship weekend the first round of the playoff. But if you right. do that, then you, you lose a little bit of that familiarity and some of the things that, that make this sport unique. It's a difficult time. They're, you know, they're trying to provide access to keep the sport healthy across the, across the continent that Pete has pointed out numerous times. And you know, if you wind up with an all-SEC, all-Big Ten playoff with the exception of the uh, conference champions, I mean, is that going to be satisfying and familiar enough, or are we going to just have a different version uh, with more teams involved of what we've what we've had the last few years, guys? In the last few minutes, I mean, I know we could talk about this all day, but man, Pete, some really uh, compelling and fascinating news that came overnight with Ohio State quarterback Kyle McCord going into the transfer portal. Um, I mean, I don't want to be hyperbolic here. But it almost feels like some type of overreaction, and you almost look at it and say, "Has this three-game losing streak to Michigan like discombobulated Ohio State to the point where I don't want to say broken? That's overstating it, but almost <clears throat> made them feel like they need to reinvent themselves, you know? Or is it is it just a simple matter of competition? You're trying to upgrade at the position, and and McCord recognized that." Yeah, um, and we just got word Dylan Gabriel is also uh, headed to the portal. Wow! Um, from 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 Oklahoma. I, did, I didn't um, even know he had more eligibility left. Dylan's been around a yeah. minute. Yes. He's one of I my think favorite he's guys. 20, I think he's twenty seven. Yeah. I was going to say um, he's thirty eight years old. Good <laughs> for him. I, yes. I, I, I no, love he, him. As I think a player, he has by one more. Yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah, player absolutely. In, yeah, this is speculation, but uh, with Mackenzie Milton at Tennessee and his old friend Josh Heupel as the head coach at Tennessee. And the Tennessee offense not looking like the Tennessee offense that our friend Ryan McGee remembered from 2022. <laughs> that is a, that that could loom as a potential landing spot, but there could also be a lot of other potential landing spots because, and I'll get back to the Ohio State question in a minute. These are 
portal potential quarterback destinations for 2022. This is an unscientific list made in about 90 seconds from when we <laughs> enter the podcast. U.S. So don't be like, you forgot about Indiana. USC, Oregon, <laughs> Washington, Ohio State, Michigan, if quarterback goes pro, Georgia, if quarterback goes pro, and don't discount that, North Carolina, Auburn, Florida State, LSU, Notre Dame, and I, I glanced at the uh, top 25 of the CFP and had to add Iowa because they certainly need a quarterback. So anyway, those are places that are going to have big coffers, big money, and when you go through who is now available, if you say McCord and then you say Dylan Gabriel, and then you go Riley Leonard, Will Howard, Cam Ward, DJ Uwe Ungalale, Will Rogers, Tyler Van Dyke, um, Grayson McCall, there's just probably not the same demand uh there's there's more need for a great quarterback than there are great quarterbacks available as of right now but it is it is monday morning and the portal is just starting to uh starting to jam out here so it it was it's going to be very interesting on ohio state i feel like and i that happened pretty early on monday morning so i haven't made any calls on it yet but i do feel like that if they did not feel like kyle mccord is a championship quarterback and he was a very good quarterback. Mm-hmm. Like it's a hard that's this is a hard decision. But I haven't talked to anyone there. But if they don't feel like he's a championship quarterback, they have to feel like they can go find a championship quarterback. And remember the uh the Drake May rumor sort of flirtation mm-hmm. from from last spring that ended up getting shot down and Drake May ended up getting a big old NIL deal from the from the heels. Like there was probably a feeling then, if they were in that derby, that they could upgrade, and um, it will be interesting to see if they're upgraded. The one thing I was just told on text about uh, about McCord is the door isn't closed. I think both sides are going to see if there's a better uh, if there's a better landing place. But um, yeah, this is uh, this is like this is t- today has turned into like NBA free agency. You know, that, like it's but that is but, a, but everyone can be a free agent. You know, people will accuse us often. Me, I'll say. Well, you, well, you talk too much about the quarterback, whether it's Jordan Travis. Well, this is this is, this is it. Exhibit yep. A of why we talk so much about the quarterbacks because in this era of football, it is the most important position on the field. Maybe it always has been, but with the way offenses are run now and the type of offense you need to run to attract uh, NFL level talent at other positions, you have to have the guy. But he also has to be the leader or else it ultimately is probably not going to work. So when I hear them say the door's not closed, I think sometimes just by opening it at that position, it's not like you're going to you know, come back and be in the rotation on the defensive front. You know, like if Bear Alexander had gone back into Kirby, he, no matter how mad he might have gotten at the time and said, hey, you know, I, I've rethought this. I might have been a little rash. I think I'd like to come back and play on your defensive line, you know. I don't know if that affects everybody on the team the same way that the guy that you've been behind for really since, what, week two or three or whatever that they, you know, kind of stopped toying with is Devin Brown going to play a lot. All of a sudden, he's he's looking around, you're looking around, and now you're going to try to come back. Um, yep. uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one for me. I, I sort of feel like that if we've gotten this far down the road that – you know, again, we're just hearing about this. Maybe there are circumstances that Ryan Day or Kyle McCord or, you know, his camp would say to me and say, hey, you hadn't thought about this. And I would go, oh, okay, I get that. But on the surface, an immediate reaction to it is that if you're, if, if you're already peeking out the door and, or if they're encouraging you to peek out the door, it's probably time to go through the door. You know, and yeah. I, I'm, I was shocked by that because I – I, I think Kyle McCord is a really good player and has a chance, like a lot of guys, to improve and be even better. And you know, but it'll be interesting to see. It's it's sort of sort of where where we are right now. I guess I get Gabriel with Jeff Levy leaving late in his career. Um, a little uncertainty there. You want to go with something a little more certain, maybe I don't know, or maybe. And you can get a payday too. Yeah, I don't right. know if Dylan Gabriel is a thumper, surefire starter in the NFL. Right. Now look, yeah. man. I never heard of Tim Boyle and Tim Boyle started an NFL game two right. years ago. Yeah. Meaning, in, in, during his college career, I was not aware of his existence. Yeah. Now, good for him for becoming an NFL starter and grinding it out. But <laughs> you see some. So, like, I'm not saying Dylan Gabriel can't go be a really solid NFL quarterback room guy. But if he can go make a million bucks, sure. And he's probably 
yeah, go go do it. it. Go go do it, young man. It, you know, and go go win big and be with your people. And maybe you know, maybe he stays in that tree and coaches ten years from now in his playing career. Is uh, is Matt Rule correct on the uh, on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. One hundred percent. Yes. Yep. And yeah. and, 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 and I was and, shocked. Was saying, Matt, how many saying, people were shocked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to, yeah. just to let list. people know if they if they aren't Matt Rule was saying to yeah. get a quarterback, it was like seven figures easy, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Please yeah. proceed. And, 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 but, it, but but to your point, Reese, I always think about when I was in college, the girl I dated for a couple of years, she came to me suddenly one day and said, hey, I think we should see other people. I was like, what? <laughs> and what I realized was she thought this guy was going to ask her out. And so she's like, you know, I just, you know, before we graduate, we should just look kind of, you know, just, just see what they, and, 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 and the guy never asked her out. So then a week later, she comes back to me. She says, you know what? I've been thinking about this. I think, I think I was wrong. We should stay together. No, that's not how that works. There's no way that's not going to change my perception. So I feel that way about these guys. Who, and I, and I, and it is, I like the fact I have no problem with the transfer portal. I like the fact that these guys who have played for these coaches who could leave at any time and ADs mm-hmm. who could leave at any time. Every, everyone can leave at any time except for the players. I have no problem with that at all. But Agreed. That, yeah. But that sociology aspect of it is never going to go away, which is what you do. But, yeah, the money is crazy to me. But also, and when there's not that top-shelf seven-figure money, like great, I love Grayson McCall. I love that kid. And, and, and Coastal Carolina, for folks that don't know, that led them to their dramatic, you know, seasons. And game day was there, and I was on the sideline for the BYU game and all that. And then the coach that he loved left and went to Liberty, Jamie Chadwell. And this year just didn't work out. And Grayson was hurt, and the team just didn't perform like he thought. And now he has a chance to look elsewhere. I don't believe that he's going to get seven figures, but I believe that he will get more than he was getting at Coastal Carolina. And he also has a chance to try to be happy somewhere and 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 so that that part to me too i have no problem with but yeah but don't be mad if you if you florida state don't be mad if you spend all summer saying we hate it here and then all of a sudden you got to sit in the meetings with the people you know i had an ad in the acc go yeah it's really interesting being in meetings now and you look across the table and go are we good enough for you now because we weren't good enough for you in the newspaper a week ago (laughs) so yeah the sociology aspect of, of all of it just fascinates me it is a, a compelling time, and you know we've got plenty of time on this podcast in the next month to uh, continue to talk about the semifinal games in the college football playoff and uh, whether Georgia and Florida State will both show up and play an epic, uh, bitter uh, showdown because both are angry about not, not getting in the playoff, or will you have a number of people uh, turn the page and start to, you know, start to look at the next chapter of their careers both all both perspectives completely justified and you know really will be part of the interesting study through all of this it is uh you know before we go the one thing that i did notice is that because of the selection made yesterday and because of the sign stealing scandal that has plagued michigan for the last half of the season uh, the Rose Bowl, the granddaddy of them all, sort of the last iteration of this version of the Rose Bowl. I know they'll be involved in the in the playoff going forward, but it's going to have a little bit of a different feel from scheduling and all that kind of thing from time to time. Um, you're going to have probably uh, the two teams that, that people love to hate the most, at least this year. Now, that's always the circumstance to some degree for Michigan and Alabama, uh, given the number of wins and the number of wins and, and championships that Alabama has. But you're going to have two teams that people are really angry at and just have contempt for, not only because of what's happened this season, but because of the history of excellence and dominance. So that might be a, uh, a compelling factor, too, because people, people will be drawn to what they love or what they love to hate. It's just sort of part of the, part of the human condition, I guess. Yeah, so uh, I'll start with this. So everyone hates Texas just because they're Texas, right? And everyone hates Michigan because of sign stealing, and everyone hates Alabama because they shouldn't be in the playoff. So, so outside of Corvallis and Pullman, no one really hates Washington. So, does that make Washington <laughs> America's team? I, I think it does. I think it does. I, I, think, I think it might be the I case. Think it does. Yeah, Roma Dunze is definitely America's receiver. <laughs> yeah. He is a blast to yeah. watch. He's. He has kind of taken over my Quentin Johnson man crush from last year that Reese would knock. I mean, he is so smooth. It's preposterous. Tra- is it always a receiver, Pete? I, I guess. I guess I have a profile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it's undersized running backs. My wife still says that uh, 
my other relationship was with Donnell Pumphrey when he was at San Diego State. <laughs> I love that kid. I still love that kid. But but I'm always like the, the undersized running back who who breaks all these records. That's always my guy. So, yeah. Are but, you up past midnight watching Donnell again, Ryan? Oh, yeah, exactly. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Making a drink and watching Donnell hang 250 on Hawaii. You got it. <laughs> oh. Gentlemen, it's been it's been fun. Certainly a uh, a memorable and controversial selection day in college football yesterday. We appreciate all of you watching that show and appreciate you listening to the podcast. We encourage you to subscribe to the College Game Day podcast or download wherever you prefer to get your podcast.